Thank you for joining us today. Please note that there is no CPE attached to this webinar. Please view our upcoming events and webinars at cbh.com for CPE opportunities. Our presentation will begin in a moment. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this webinar this afternoon to talk about business systems, providing various overviews as well as um, how audits are handled um, there too. Um, my name is Bryn McNeil. I am an assurance partner in our government services um, division. Javier Diaz is a manager that's long in our group, and Eric Poppy also a senior manager. So Cherry Beckard is a full service accounting firm. Um, we do both audit, tax, and advisory services. And really, we do work a lot with government contractors as it is an area that we pride ourselves with a lot of technical expertise. Um, kind of as it relates to this topic today, we do help clients oftentimes when they are having um, accounting systems or any business system really reviewed or audited. Um, there's many aspects of how we can really help and add some value there too. So I'm happy to always be a sounding board or a resource if you are going through an audit or looking to have a business system um, approved. So really taking a look at our agenda, um, we're going to talk about a variety of things as you can see. We're going to provide an overview of the six business systems, um, what causes business system triggers. We're really going to focus our topic today and our discussion today on the three most relevant business systems and the approaches by both DCMA and DCAA. We'll also um, talk about the performance audits that are performed by those two agencies and the approach to the various business systems. Um, we'll talk through a few strategic advantages of having a um, business system. And then we'll also go through various changes to a few of the rules and then wrap it up with just some general best practices as it relates to business systems in general. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Eric, and he's going to really give us an overview of the various business systems. Thank you, Bryn, and I will speak for Javi and myself that we're excited to be talking about systems here today. You know, from a government contracting standpoint, um, and recently with the current uh, audit environment and the positioning of the government, um, you know, in, in, in the past, it hasn't been as much of a focus in recent years by DCAA on the systems themselves. Um, recently, actually very recently, there's been more of a, a shift in the perspective of the government with since DTA has been getting caught up on the accounting system audits, um, and your, or not accounting system, sorry, your incurred, incurred cost submission audits to be more of a focus on the business systems and accounting systems uh, and more of a, a, a focus on that since they've been they meet or met the backlog, backlog. So overall, the government sees the systems themselves as the first line of defense against any type of um, fraud, waste, and abuse when it comes to spending the government's uh, money and the taxpayer dollar. So prior to 2012, there were many systems, um, and a lot that they've all been consolidated now since 2012 into six systems, which um, is accounting, purchasing estimating, EVMS, government property or property management, and MMAS. You know, from our standpoint and a lot of the clients that we work with here in the DC area, and especially from more service-based, um, being more in the mid-market range, the systems that come under the most scrutiny are the accounting, purchasing, and estimating. So to talk real quick about what triggers these business system requirements, um, there is a DFARS clause, it's 252-242-7005, that gives, that is a clause that might be inserted in any DOD contract um, regarding the business system, and it covers all six. But really the, the triggers can be, uh, can happen from a variety of reasons. You, and you be, can become under focus of the government, and your system is under focus, based off of you know, certain items. One, if you are now transitioning from a small business to a, other than small, or to a large business. Um, a lot of systems have exemptions because you are considered a small business. Also, the type of contract that you have. Is the, are you cash covered? Is the contract cash covered? Um, and that you know, plays into the size as well. 
Next is uh, particular RFP requirements. So some RFPs actually and, and some contracts will, might require an approved system, and that's also uh, dependent on contract type too. So for example, if you have a cost reimbursable or flexibly priced contract, you are supposed to meet the pre-award accounting system criteria um, and have a, an, a potentially approved accounting system before even getting a cost plus type contract. Um, and then lastly, um, there are some certain dollar thresholds that uh, could be a requirement too. So for example, purchasing system is required at right now at 25 million um, if you have that, if you make that much in one year with the government. Um, that, you know, that might change for a proposed rule that we'll talk about soon, but right now it, um, it is 25. So there are some dollar values there too. Um, you know, some items that are not included on this slide, there could be contracting officer specific um, requests for an approved system that can happen with estimating. Uh, and um, same with government property as well. The implications of outgrowing size standards. A lot of small companies uh, come to us when they're starting to grow and uh, ask us what this means, what, what effect it's going to have on them. The, the, the biggest and, and uh, um, most obvious impact would be the cost to the contractor. Um, there'd be additional costs uh, to implement the uh, new processes related to the cash coverage and business system uh, to be uh, compliant with the business system standards. Um, the, the thing to think about when uh, you're uh, implementing these new policies, procedures, and systems is that, yes, there may be more costs up front, but in the long run, um, you would gain efficiencies that would help you save money. So uh, an example would be your estimating system. If you ha implement these policies and procedures, you'd have more accurate uh, proposals or estimates, which would entail or limit the risk of underbidding uh, what your actual cost would be. Other um, implications are you'd be uh, unable to compete at the same advantage. So if you're a small business set aside, now you're going to have to start bidding against larger companies with, and you would also lack the resources that those uh, large government contractors already have. So uh, those are things to think about as you're, you're growing. So uh, some of the system limitations that usually occur when, when as you're growing, as far as the accounting system, there's uh, rate limitations in your system. So uh, a lot of smaller companies that have, let's say, uh, use Excel or QuickBooks, their systems can't handle having multiple indirect rates. Or, or if you have multiple contracts and one contract has a, a rate cap, it's going to be a manual process where you would have to start thinking about, hey, um, is it time to get a, a, a more robust accounting system that can handle these things? Because um, it's taking too much time to do this stuff manually. As far as estimating system, there's a, a companies that lack a true estimating system. So when you think about system, it isn't only the software. The, uh, it's also policies and procedures. It's also uh, making sure that everything is documented. It, 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 all of that, those things inside and outside of a, a computer are what uh, make up a, a, a true system. Also, it, uh, the estimating system lacks the ability to pretty much look forward. Uh, as things coming down the pipeline, uh, how does it in, uh, affect our indirect rates? What is this going to have? Uh, what effect is this going to have on our uh, proposals if the contract is out for multiple years? As far as purchasing, same thing, a lack of uh, true purchasing system. It's not really just your AP. It's uh, making sure you have a, an approved vendor list, it's making sure that uh, the vendors that you're doing business with are living up to the same quality that you guys want to give to the government. And last would be the uh, focus on a proposal scoring criteria versus adequacy. So a lot of companies, they'll um, focus more on the scores for the uh, RFPs uh, uh, rather than the act, have an accurate system that they can depend on uh, the information. So to add to, add to that, um a couple things. One with purchasing, not just AP, but a lot of the expense reporting tool that might be in their uh, in their timekeeping or their time and expense system. Company that doesn't count. You know, expense reporting, your AP process, 
there aren't the controls and processes in place to be a, considered a true purchasing system. Um, and then the focus on scoring criteria, you know, Javi, we've seen a lot of companies that when they're responding to an RFP, they're just trying to throw together a, you know, whatever type of policy or documentation they can yeah. to try to have the outline of a, a system manual just to try to get that extra point or two when submitting an RFP. But, you know, the worst thing that, from my opinion, that you can do is throw something together and it really not be your, your actual process or policy yeah. and, and it's not potentially act, adequate or you think it's adequate and then the government comes in and states that it's not adequate and then that's what you submitted as part of your proposal. So it's that's not true as well. Yeah, I think it's it's worse to give something to the government that you're not doing than not have a policy in place. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you're saying you're doing something, you better be doing it and documenting it. Yep. If you're doing something totally different, then it's even it's not just a slap on the wrist. So and you know it, it's so true. And then with the accounting system. We see this a lot. Um, you mentioned QuickBooks and you know doing manual processes outside when it comes to your indirect rates and your contract pricing systems that can't handle having you know flexibly priced complex flexibly priced contracts with you know being able to apply indirect rates to certain types of cost elements or having multiple cost reimbursable contracts that have different caps because you know you're trying to maybe one contract is with an agency that you're trying to get your foot in the door, so you're capping your rates, you're self-capping, mm -hmm. but then another agency, you're working with them all the time and have multiple cost reimbursable contracts, and then you're not capping, but you have some, maybe some rate differences when it comes to how you're applying that that's contract specific. So having systems that can handle that billing process, and it also doesn't just impact the system, but it also could impact your financial reporting down the line too. And, and we're actually going through this with one of the clients that we have that um, they're having issues trying to bolt on system to cap the rates onto their current accounting system. Up front, I mean, it might be a hit, but it, it probably makes more sense to uh, spend a little bit more to get a system that will take care of all that stuff than go through the actual headaches and heartburn of having to figure out how to bolt on a, a module or, uh, or spend all those man hours. Mm -hmm. so. It'll save you a lot of frustration. It really will. So, going a little more high level into the six systems themselves. Again, their their accounting system estimating, material management and accounting, purchasing, government property, and earned value management. All of these are underneath the criteria of the DFARS clause. Um, you know, these are also mentioned in some FAR clauses and also the other agency of supplemental. Uh, Regulations also have a lot of times reference back to this DFARS clause. So, you know, a, a real quick, just what are the triggers of this? First, the accounting system. Accounting system, the real trigger there is um, if you have a cost reimbursable type contract, you need to hit certain criteria. And the DFARS clause, the criteria that we're going to walk through um, a little bit later, and also uh, is that it's laid out in that clause. It is very similar to what is in a pre-award SF-1408. So um, an accounting pre-award survey, it, it pretty much could they go hand in hand almost. Um, the, if it's a post-award or the full 18 criteria, it talks a little bit more about controls and kind of after the fact, not just capability, but you know, is your system actually doing this? Whereas a 1408 is reviewing more, is the system capable of hitting these certain requirements? So it's a little bit of, you know, uh, forward-looking versus are you actually doing it? Uh, but the system, the criteria is pretty much the same. Um, from a purchasing side, the requirements are really triggered for if you have a lot of purchases. Twenty-five million is the number that I mentioned before. Um, estimating system falls in line with if mostly if you're cash covered. And that's just triggered. There are certain situations that a contracting officer might say that's specific, um, or if you have a large one large single award, the threshold there's 10 million. And then government property, EVMS, and MMAS, those systems that not as many government contractors have to deal with. The really large contractors have to deal with EVMS and MMAS a lot more. Um, but those are triggered by large awards too. 
Um, again, the requirements are there if it is cash covered. However, typically mid-market sized companies don't have to worry about these too much. Government property is applicable if you have, if you're handling government property and property management system. There are a lot of criteria around, you know, tagging, tagging government property management of that. Can you track where it is and who checks it out, and who's using it? Um, and then talking a little bit about spoilage and inventory management there. But, um, you know, to circle back today, we're really going to focus more on the accounting system, estimating and purchasing. So this slide um, really details the, the time frames in which these reviews are or these audits are performed. For the most part, uh, all of them are performed uh, every three years. Um, the ones that stand out would be the uh, purchasing system, which is uh, done by DCMA, and it's it completed every three to five years. And as uh, the property management system, which is completed every uh, one to three years. Uh, based on a risk assessment. Okay, Javier, before we go too far, we did just get a question um, that popped through. So I'll just ask it now because it's pretty relevant to, I think, I'm reading this slide here. Um, but someone's asking if they just had their accounting system approved last year and they are potentially changing that, do they have to go through that audit again even though it hasn't been three years? So potentially the, the contracting officer would uh, uh, request uh, a new audit be performed on the new system. They want to make sure that um, it, it, it's compliant and it's able to uh, accumulate costs uh, accurately. Um, so uh, yes, there is potential for them to uh, have to get audited before the three-year time frame is up. However, with DCAA uh, spending more time doing business systems, um, it, it they might not get into the door before those three years are up. So it all depends on how quickly DCAA would, would be able to audit the new system, but um, the potential is there. And, and to add to that, I would suggest the company reach out to the contracting officer stating, hey, we know this accounting system, um, we have an approved accounting system, we know this was reviewed you know, last year, we just updated to or upgraded, implemented a new system, um, and bring it to the attention of the contracting officer. So hopefully there could be upward pressure that comes down to get it reviewed again. Yep. I mean, communication with your contracting officer is key to, to anything that uh, you decide to do on a, on a specific contract. Then this slide is pretty much the same information that we had in the previous slide, just uh, uh, broken out differently and uh, providing. Um, the defaults reference. So if you want to uh, go into the uh, clauses uh, or the actual reg to uh, figure out what you have to have in order to comply with each one of these systems, then these are the defaults references that, uh, that you would be going to. So one other item is that under the umbrella of DCMA versus DCAA, there are certain systems that uh, apply. So under the DCMA umbrella, you have a contract purchasing system, DVMS, and government property. Under the DCAA umbrella, you have accounting system, MMAS, and estimating. Um, you know, there are certain situations when the auditors from one or the other might assist the other side, exactly. um, but for the most part, that's the umbrella exactly. of who handles, which agency handles which yeah. systems. It, it seems like DCMA is trying to pull all of their reviews more in-house when before they were depending more on DCAA. So as Eric mentioned, we're really just going to focus on um, three systems primarily today, the accounting system, purchasing system, and estimating system. And really, these are the systems that we find are the most impactful to most government contractors that I think are most relevant. Um, these next slides, what our intent is to do is to really provide a high level of the criteria, specifically on the accounting system. I think just due to time constraints, we might not go into too much of the criteria on the purchasing and estimating system, um, as well as talking about common pitfalls within each of the three systems, and then the government approach to doing the reviews for these systems. Um, so we'll kick it off with talking about the criteria of accounting systems, and Javier, I'll turn it to you to kind of walk through what that criteria looks like. So uh, DFARS has 18 criteria, and uh, we're going to highlight a couple of them. Um, 
as we're going through this, you'll see that there's a lot of uh, common uh, criteria with the uh, when compared to the 1408. So um, as Eric mentioned before, the main focus of DFARS is to uh, have sound internal con uh, a sound internal internal control area. This includes the uh, accounting uh, framework and organizational structure of the uh, of the system and. As I mentioned before, it isn't just the software, it's policies and procedures, it's everything that that uh, affects the accounting or, or accumulation of costs. Proper segregation of uh, direct costs from indirect costs, this should be familiar to all uh, government contracts, uh, contractors, as uh, this is also included in the 1408. Identification and accumulation of direct costs by contract and a logical and consistent um, method for accumulation and allocation of indirect costs to intermediate and final cost objectives. And I can say that of the three systems, this certainly has the most impact for any, really any test engagement that we do. So be that a accounting or a, a review or an audit of the financial statement, this area where if these criteria are not in place, um, it really would impact any test engagement that we do. I mean, having a sound internal control environment is a really key part of the audit. And then we do spend a lot of time focusing our time on looking at costs and have they been charged appropriately and are they reasonable? Because in essence, that's really what's driving our revenue and where we're really focusing our risk on. So um, I can say that this is certainly a very important system as it relates to just really any test engagement. Um, some other uh, criteria are you have to have a, a timekeeping system that identifies uh, identifies employees' labor and by intermediate and or final cost objectives. So um, uh, you definitely need to be able to keep track of all time. Um, DCAA, although it's nowhere in in the regs, uh, DCAA does ask that time be kept on a, a daily basis. The labor distribution system that charges direct and indirect labor to appropriate cost objectives. So this is making sure you have total time that's uh, taken into a con a consideration and that labor rates are adjusted based on how many hours an employee is uh, working. And identification of, of cost by contract line item and by unit if required by the contract. For the most part, it's easier for the contractor to keep track of these costs if, if um, the uh, uh, accumulation is in line with the contracting uh, uh, or the contract line item. The criteria are listed on the SF-1408 utilized by DCAA conducting an accounting system survey. You also want to look at DFARS because there are some additional uh, requirements that aren't included in the uh, 1408 if uh, DFARS is applicable. So uh, having an adequate system includes adequate software and chart of accounts. So this goes back to the 1408. Can you uh, uh, accumulate costs, dividing them up or segregating them by uh, direct versus indirect, uh, uh, identify unallowable costs? Uh, chart of accounts is probably going to be the first thing uh, that a DCA auditor is going to request when they come in uh, to the door to uh, perform an accounting system audit. Uh, adequate policies and procedures, and like we said before, uh, these need to be current and need to document what you're doing. Um, it's better to uh, not have anything than to have policies and procedures that are saying you're doing something and you're not doing it. And uh, last but not, but not least, properly trained personnel. We've walked into uh, or helped clients that have had employees that aren't really trained with the regulations and um, it could be a nightmare. I'm thinking of a couple of clients that we've had where employees weren't properly trained and were doing things totally overall. Yeah, some of the training that um, specifically for the accounting system that should be emphasized would be unallowable cost training, being able to identify and segregate those um, from an expense reporting side, uh, and then also from a billing standpoint, project management, um, understanding common unallowables. Um, and this can go into policies as well and having established policies that uh, can almost be a guide or a cheat sheet for identifying those unallowables. On top of that, 
proper control over uh, contract contract costs and contract funding and monitoring that um, should be part of your project management and should be part of your um, should the system should be capable of of accumulating costs to date mm -hmm. um, or inception to date. Um, timekeeping is always huge. It seems that there's a lot of hiccups in timekeeping. Is usually the biggest culture shock as well, especially if you're a company that's just starting to get into government contracting, uh, and you're about to win your first flexibly priced contract. You know, if you were always on the commercial side or had just fixed price, timekeeping is one of those big hurdles that it it, it can be, it, as I said, a big culture shock to the employees because now they're required to keep time down to the hour uh, to do it on a daily basis. You have it reviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, it can become cumbersome if you don't keep up with it. So, and not only a culture shock to the employees that now have to do timesheets, but also to the accounting staff that now have to provide the labor costs, mm -hmm. depending on the type of cost. Is it fringe? Is it GNA? Is it a direct to the contract? Yep. So, some of the common problem areas that we've seen in general are compliance with unusual RFP requirements and uh, a lack of continuity or uniformity among systems. So the the uh, information or the, the cost or the data that we're uh, um, accumulating or, or recording or, or, or estimating, the, it, it flows throughout all of these accounting systems. So having proper uh, uh, records of costs incurred will help you with your estimating system because you use your historicals for um, for coming up with a new estimate, right, uh, or things like that, or having a, a proper purchasing system where you're re, uh, doing adequate uh, uh, cost analysis will help you with your proposals also. Because uh, when you come, when the auditor comes in for to review those estimates, they're going to ask for those type of documents. So all of these uh, systems are communicating, and information is being shared throughout them, throughout uh, each of them. As far as uh, accounting system, we've uh, uh, detailed quite a few of these already, but um, lack of formal or written policies and procedures, uh, uncompensated overtime, this goes into your total time uh, accounting, uh, having contract briefs, these are the documents that Eric was saying we, you can use as uh, your, uh, your cheat sheet, your billing team could use them to make sure that the costs that are, are being invoiced are, are uh, allowable by the contract. Uh, inconsistent estimating versus uh, accumulating practices, and accounting personnel not really familiar with uh, FAR requirements. So switching focus is a little bit now to purchasing and estimating. So just like Bryn mentioned, just because of time constraints, uh, we are not going to go through the criteria for purchasing and estimating for the purchasing and estimating systems. Um, we will be putting out further guidance at some point in the near future about those criteria, either in a blog, an article, or maybe another webinar. So if you have particular questions on purchasing or estimating, please feel free to reach out. Uh, but you know, some common areas that we see with the purchasing system, and really it goes back to what Javi was saying and what a lot of issue, or a lot of companies have is just lack of formal written policies and procedures. Um, as you also grow and you might have subcontractors, there's now more of an emphasis on subcontract monitoring. This is something that there have been uh, DCAs put MRDs on talking about more oversight on subcontractors. That if you're a prime, you should be checking in with them on if they have approved systems. Are they submitted their ICSs? Is there are their costs um, cost proposals? Are those um, adequate and considered reasonable? Is, is there cost and pricing that's being um, applied to those cost proposals. Um, so really understanding, you know, what and monitoring the subs that might be rolled up and underneath you. There's also lack of you know, sole source justifications and documentation of why you selected that subcontractor or trying to utilize your small business plan and sourcing those individuals. And then also um, approve that it doesn't just hit subcontractors but vendors. What vendors are you using? Are they on your approved vendor list? Are they on the barred list? Are they on you know, certain terrorist watch list? Um, and we can go down some rabbit holes of, you know, Buy America and other FAR clauses that impact your purchasing system uh, that could impact this as well. There's a recent clause that's been flowing out about 
proper telecommunications uh, equipment and not being, uh, you know, paraphrasing here and summarizing of, uh, you know, not being China-based or from certain yeah. companies in China. So there are other ancillary requirements that impact this as well. So for estimating, again, lack of policies and procedures, I think a really big concern uh, for a, you know, other than large company who's not a small business anymore is now you have to do true estimating. Uh, and it's not just using your accounting system and your historic costs, but having that forward looking and also being consistent with how you accumulate your costs so you don't have a, a different approach there. Um, Saying that, if you are cash covered or modified cash covered, those practices need to be in line. So you can't, in short, estimate costs at a lower level of detail than you're accumulating. Um, and there needs to be consistency in how you apply that. Um, you know, actually having a formal proposal process, actually having sign-offs and checklists and um, what rates you're using. And your BD folks can't be you know, shooting from the hip on rates to meet the needs of an agency and not come back and talk to the accounting and finance department. So those are some common areas that we typically and, see. And just to add on real quick, um, one of the most important things that you have to do for all these systems is whatever you're doing, document it. If you're not documenting it and DCAA comes in through the door, then you didn't do it. There's no way for you to prove it. So make sure all of all of this stuff is documented by email or by sign offs, however you decide to do it. Yeah. Again, um, the DFARS rule really focuses on more of internal control. So being able to show the controls are in place, the reviews are in place, um, and the approvals are in place really helps out. Yeah. You know, next we're going to talk a little bit about DCAA's approach for these three different systems. So. Right now, we are seeing more of a, as I mentioned, a push towards review of systems from DCAA versus historically they've been focused more recently on incurred cost emissions. But since there's been a, um, a catch up for the most part on all the ICS audits, now that the shift is going back. So for an accounting system, um, there are, let me actually back up, certain agencies might actually use a third party accounting firm to perform some of these uh, reviews as well. Um, you know, DOE, Department of Energy, uses the third party. We've seen it with USAID. We've seen it with HHS. We've seen, uh, DCAA recently uh, has contracted out to have a third party firm do it for, for cost emissions. Mm -hmm. So if, the, if you have a third party contact you, say um, another accounting firm, that is typically, that is at the direction of the government. The government would give your company's name to that third-party accounting firm, and they would reach out and do that. Um, if you have any questions on that, and if it's legit, you know, please, we're happy to help uh, review any requests that you might have. But for DCAA, the accounting system, uh, you typically see pre-award if you're smaller and you're about to win your first, or you're trying to win your first flexibly priced contract versus a post-award accounting system audit. Uh, there are different variations of this post-award. Um, I've seen just direct costs. I've seen for major, there's a different audit program for major contractors versus non-major. Uh, but really, the focus is uh, a very similar criteria. One has more of an internal control view. One is more of capability. Pre-award is your system capability. Um, that's really the, the difference between the two. For purchasing system, uh, DCAA typically isn't the one that performs this. This is under the the scope of DCMA, but they might ask for assist on this. DCMA might ask for an assist on this. Um, and we are starting to see that coming down the line too. And you can see the FAR references in FAR Part 44 that talks about CPSR and when is it required. And right now that's 25 million. Estimating system, right now, it, you might see flash reports coming through. Um, again, this is now becoming more of a focus. So some general practices for any uh, system review that might occur, the government's gonna want, uh, is gonna send an initial request list uh, to get, first thing is policy procedures. There will be additional walkthroughs uh, where they'll actually ask to come through and typically see you running through the system live, asking for screenshots, asking for documentation right then. After that walkthrough, the government will 
send an additional request depending on if it's um, you know, the full scope of the system review, they might ask for sampling of certain transactions, certain proposals, certain approvals to get a real understanding of the system. You know, for DCMA, their focus is on contract purchasing system reviews or CTSRs. Again, DCAA might help out. Typically, a team, there, there used to be a team that really performed that. They specialize in CTSRs. Um, all of these reviews are actually under performance audits. Uh, and it is not considered a test in any way. They will talk about this in a little bit, but the typical team approach for the CPSRs is changing a little bit, so we'll talk about that in a few slides. So one thing I did want to mention is, you know, we, we just mentioned DCMA and DCAA in the reviews, and they're the ones, or third-party accounting firms, that are coming in and conducting these assessments on your systems. Um, but the person that really has the, the final say is your contracting officer. And your contracting officer is the one that gives the approval or disapproval of your system. All these reports from the third-party accounting firm, DCAA or DCMA, could roll up to that contracting officer. So we just wanted to include this, this slide, is they're the ones that really has the final say over, is this system acceptable? And we have seen certain situations that, uh, especially if you're a smaller contractor, you might not be a small business, but a smaller contractor, and you want to get an approved system, we have seen situations that if you have a good relationship with your contracting officer, contacting them and asking them to help apply pressure to get a review done. And if that doesn't work, asking if you can get a third party to come in and review your system and see if that's accept uh, acceptable. So work with your contracting officer in communicating those types of requests, but they're the ones that have the final say. Um, and they're the ones that would be give the direction on any withholds if there is a significant deficiency. So what happens after the audit? Once DCAA or DCMA complete their review, uh, they're going to provide the report to the contracting officer. Uh, the contracting officer then has 10 days to uh, review the findings and provide a, uh, uh, a letter of approval or disapproval to the contractor within 10 days within those 10 days. The contractor would then have 30 days to respond to the uh, contracting officer's initial determination. And uh, if there's a significant deficiencies, the contractor must also submit a corrective action plan. And um, all of this needs to be done. The contractor's priority should be to make sure that there's no potential withholding um, on future invoices. The more warm and fuzzies you give the contracting mm -hmm. officer that you're uh, putting things into place to make sure that it doesn't happen again or that you can correct it with the corrective action, uh, act, uh, your corrective action plan, uh, the better. Uh, that'll help you in the future with, as far as invoicing and not getting any withholding. So I know if you're right now uh, in that transition from a small business to large business, a lot of the Tension on business systems can be pretty daunting, and you're thinking about, you know, oh man, how am I going to find these resources to do this? How are we going to find the money to implement these new systems? You know, we try to run a pretty lean shop. You know, what this is going to change everything? Well, yes, it will, but it also could help you in other ways. Um, one, you know, we're starting to see more and more RFPs come down that have that ask for evidence of an approved system. So from a scoring side, it will it will help you in response to any proposals. But also, they're, they're starting to, the government's putting emphasis on systems and that it is the first line of defense against any fraud. <clears throat> Second, um, we suggest really working with the government to try to have alternative approaches to getting approval by the government on your system. You know, I mentioned having a third party come in and review. Um, if DCA or DCMA aren't paying any attention, talking with the government about that and show that you're trying to do the right thing. You know, you could also, once you do have an approved system and have uh, spent the, the time and resources to, you know, implement and have more robust policies and, you know, of whatever system it is, you know, use that as a marketing opportunity and use that as something of when you go and you're doing matchmaking for what, um, maybe mentor protégés or small businesses or you're going to meet with agencies, you know, use that as a 
as a um, an arrow uh, that that you have approved systems and that's something that you can handle. Um, and secondly, it does make you more competitive and puts you on the same more of a level playing field when competing against these large contractors. I mean, having that the those that credit for those adequate systems is important, especially when you're going up against large contractors, because a lot of these large contractors could be incumbent uh, con uh, on the contract that you're bidding on. So you need to have any extra points or any 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 uh, any advantage to try to compete with them. So lastly, we've seen a few new rules that are coming out and more changes in the marketplace. One, there was a recent um, uh, proposed rule to up the CPSR requirements to 50 million. Uh, so the idea there going from 25 million for a purchasing system to 50 million was to yeah, you know, really help lower the amount of backlog of CPSR by the government, but also take some burden off the contractor. So we're waiting for a final rule on that right now. Um, recently, the biggest thing that we've ch seen a difference is, is that all of a sudden system review requests from the government have sort of popping up left and right. We've seen a lot more accounting, we've seen a lot more purchasing, and um, not as much estimating yet, but there seems to be a lot more of an emphasis by the government to assess contractor systems. You know, I've been to a, a multiple different presentations and conferences where the government has said, you know, we've caught up on the incurred cost emission audits, now it's time to focus on systems. Some things to worry about there and you know, start to get your documentation aligned is you've had auditors for the last five years or more doing a lot of them just primarily ICS audits because there was such a backlog. Now they're all relearning how to do system audits or system reviews again. So you know, how will they be as ready and educated as we want them to be about the criteria? You know, you might deal you're dealing with some inexperience there. So you know, prepare, be prepared there with documentation, patience, and, and and sometimes don't be scared to push back because they too. might be requesting things that are out of scope. So you um, there's things that don't make sense that they're requesting that that uh, you might have to push back on. Mm -hmm. Very true. And then lastly, we have seen more of an emphasis on subcontract monitoring yeah. and a push to to monitor the subs, their costs, their proposals, and their systems as well. You know, some general best practices um, that we suggest, just be, be prepared and be um, confident in your walkthroughs. You know, have test transactions to be able to walk through and have examples there. Javi, you've talked about this a lot, of putting your best people in front of yeah. DCAA. Yeah. And not only put your best people in front of DCAA, let everybody know that DCAA is in the building. I remember one time uh, when I was working for DCAA, Myself and another auditor were in one cubicle, and the next cubicle over, somebody was joking with their coworker, like, ha, yeah, I want to see how management is going to be able to uh, uh, provide significant support for this course when the auditors come in the door. And we're sitting right next to them, and it's like, really, our ears just perched up automatically. So make sure everybody knows that DCA is there, and, and make sure you put your best people in front of them when completing the walkthroughs or um, give it any details to the type of cost uh, incurred. Um, I would also say to make sure everyone's properly trained. You have evidence of that training. Yes, um, document everything. Document everything, and that hits the last point of processes, reviews, and approvals all need to be documented. Yes. So, um, you know, overall, it's, I don't think it's, it just takes a little bit of work to prepare for if an audit does come through. Yes, and if, if your first question to yourself when when you receive the notice of an audit is, okay, how do I get ready for this? It's already too late. Yeah, most of these system audits, they're going to go back a year um, to, to request supporting documents. So you have to be pre prepared for that, uh, that audit before that, so that uh, everything that the auditor is looking at is compliant. So we mentioned this in an earlier slide, but really um, having an adequate accounting system really is impactful when it does come to any attest engagement. But specifically, if you're having an audit done for your financial statement, there's many items that both Javier and Eric have talked about today that really also would have an impact on the audit of the financials as well. 
So I figured I would just highlight in a shameless plug to talk a little bit about an audit for the financials. Mm -hmm. um, a few things here that really I thought were very relevant from how and what um, we've been discussing today. But really, I know that Javier especially has mentioned this many, many times, but the processes and policies, you know, as part of the audit for financials, we have to get an understanding of the internal control environment. And to do that, we would be requesting and relying on internal control narratives that detail out what are your processes and your policies. And then we, too, are performing walkthroughs over that area. Another area where I know Javier was talking about this earlier is just your timekeeping. And as part of the audit, um, procedures are being performed over timekeeping and labor. So there are control tests that are performed as part of the audit. Um, another area is looking at the cash disbursements and cost allowability, making sure that unallowable costs have been recorded appropriately and that the company does understand and have processes in place to adequately charge um, direct costs versus indirect costs. And that ties into the last one. We also do perform analytics over the indirect rates, especially if you're a contractor with cost type contracts, you know, we do pay attention to what the indirect rate structure looks like and are the rates reasonable that are ultimately um, being included on those contracts. So there's a lot of what has been discussed today that also can be pretty impactful when you're thinking about just from a financial statement perspective and especially going through an audit there too. Um, I, I know we've talked a lot today and there's been a lot of valuable information provided we are more than happy to share the slides. Um, we've also included all of our contact information as well. Um, there are a couple questions, but I'm going to hold off because I think we're, we're kind of hitting a limit on time here. Um, but we do appreciate you all sticking with us and hope that you have um, at least received a few tips or tricks from today and also have a better understanding of why really having a robust business system, um, for me especially the accounting system, um, is so critical and crucial um, for companies today. So thanks again for joining us. And um, again, we'll get back to those of you who still have questions. Thank you.